Okay. So we'll continue with Shanti Deva this evening. And I told you that the next uh, section of verses are some of my favorite ones. And that's because they're very practical verses. Um, Shanti Deva uh, just talks about things that occur every day and gives us very good advice on how to integrate them in our practice. So we left off on verse 33, right? We completed that. So verse 34. When, just as I am about to act, I see that my mind is tainted with defilement, at such a time I should remain unmovable like a piece of wood. Okay, so there's a bunch of, of verses that are coming up where Shanti Deva is saying, if this is about to happen or if I'm about to do this, then you know, stop and remain like a piece of wood. Now, we have to understand what this means, yeah? So here he's saying, if I'm about to act and I see that my mind is tainted with defilement, okay? So I'm about to open my mouth and say something really mean to somebody because I'm really mad at him. And I see that my mind's tainted with defilement as my mouth is about to open. At such a time, I should remain unmovable like a piece of wood. Now, does that mean that all of a sudden, you know, I'm talking to somebody and I go, and I freeze and I'm unmovable like a piece of wood? No. Does it mean all of a sudden I'm stiff and stand up like a piece of wood? No, it doesn't mean that. A piece of wood, okay? Does a piece of wood care about what other people think about it? Does a piece of wood feel like it has to get even when somebody does it wrong? Does a piece of wood get jealous when somebody else is better than it? Does a piece of wood feel lonely and mope around the house and feel sorry for itself? A piece of wood doesn't care about all those things, does it? Okay, a piece of wood isn't interested. It has no time for it. So when Shanti Deva is recommending that we remain like a piece of wood, it means that we have the mental attitude as if we were a piece of wood. And a piece of wood just doesn't make a big deal about all these things. Okay? So, like I said, it doesn't mean that we, you know, all of a sudden stand up straight or we freeze like a piece of wood. No, we have a mental attitude that doesn't care about these things. So if I'm about to act under the influence of defilement and I notice this, then being, you know, unmovable like a piece of wood would be to say, to be, have the mindset that says, you know, I'm about to act out of defilement because I'm upset, I'm jealous, whatever. If I were acting like a piece of wood, if there were a piece of wood, where's a piece of wood? I don't even have a piece of wood. Okay, let's pretend. Would a piece of wood care about this thing that I'm so upset about? Would a piece of wood want to tell somebody off? No. So let's let my mind be like a piece of wood and just not care about this and not get so worked up about something that's so unimportant. Okay? 
So this is what we mean when we're talking about being like a piece of wood. So wouldn't that be something if we were about to say something really nasty and then we just stopped and said, okay, I'm dropping it. Ah, what a relief. I don't need to tell somebody off. I don't need to make a big fuss out of this. Huh, I feel better. Okay? Getting what I'm saying here? Okay. So let's continue. Never should I look around distractedly for no purpose. With a resolute mind, I should always keep my eyes cast downwards. So what it's saying, never should I look around distracted for no purpose. So how do we walk down the street? Oh, what's in that shop window? Oh, look at that person over there. Oh, look, here's this restaurant my friend told me about. Oh, I really like that. I would like to get that. I have to remember what shop it's at. Oh, uh, here this this person. Oh, that's what we're like, right? Yeah, we are distractedly looking around like we have ball bearings on our neck, you know? So what happens when we're distractedly looking around? Our mind's just full of rubbish and distraction. So instead, Shantideva is saying, with a resolute mind, in other words, with a mind that wants to stay calm and collected, we keep our eyes downcast. Now, that doesn't mean we, we walk down the street like this. You know, not looking at anybody, my eyes are downcast. I'm Mrs. Serious, Buddhist practitioner. You know, don't look at anybody. No, it doesn't mean like that. But we do keep our eyes downcast because there's lots of little insects that are walking all over the sidewalk. And we don't want to step on them. Yeah, so we look where we're going so we don't step on an insect and harm somebody. And then that also prevents all this distraction in our mind. <coughs> in order to relax the gaze, for a short while I should look around. And if someone appears in my field of vision, I should look at them and say, welcome. So, you know, we don't always keep our eyes just fixed down, fixed, glued to the ground. But sometimes to relax our gaze, we look around. And if we happen to see somebody else, we have a pleasant uh, expression on our face and we greet them and say hello. Okay, that's a nice thing to do. Now in so many cities across the world, everybody is so busy rushing to go somewhere that they don't even look at each other when they walk past each other on the street. Yeah, I think, and that makes for a very, very cold society. I think it's much nicer when we're walking. You know, we, we walk, watch where we're going, we don't step on any bugs. But if we see somebody, we look up and we smile and say hello. Yeah. Makes, it makes Singapore a very warm city. Yeah. Whereas if everybody's rushing around, I gotta go make more money, I gotta go make more money. Um, you know, <laughs> then it's not gonna be very friendly here or very pleasant for anybody. To check as if there is any danger on the path, I should look again and again in all four directions. To rest, I should turn my head around and then look behind me. So Shantideva is talking here, you know, if you're in a situation where it could be dangerous, you know, if you're going to cross Lavender Road somewhere, uh, you look in all the different directions, especially if you're somebody like me who's used to looking one way <laughs> when you cross the street and all of a sudden you have to look the other way. Now, which way do I, I? Now I get so confused, I can't figure out which way is I'm supposed to look, even when I'm back in my own country. So I always have to look both ways. <laughs> okay. So, 
you know, we look around and see if there's anything dangerous. We might look behind us to see if there's a bicycle coming from behind, or maybe somebody who's jogging coming from behind. Uh, you know, so we take care when we're walking. Having examined both ahead and behind, I should proceed to either come or go. Being aware of the necessity for f such mindful awareness, I should behave like this in all situations. Okay, so we examine ahead, examine behind. We know whether we're coming, whether we're going, and we're very aware of what we're doing. So remember I was saying in the previous days we have mindfulness that remembers what to practice and what to avoid, what our precepts are, that we, you know, the actions we don't want to do, what the virtuous actions are that we want to do. And then we have this introspective awareness that sees if we're actually doing like that and that pays attention, well, what am I doing? And how am I doing it? And am I doing it at the right time? Okay, and so this introspective alertness is very, very useful on a practical level. Because, for example, example, how many times do you have things that you need to take with you, but you walk out of your flat and leave them at home because you forgot them? Happened to you? That's because we don't have any introspective awareness because our introspective awareness would pause at the doorway and say what do I need to bring with me yeah where am I going why am I going there what do I need to bring with me and then it would make sure it has everything you know we have everything we need for where we're going and we know where we're going in other words we're not just walking out of the door uh, kind of just to, I don't know, ride the bus, ride the MTR, drive around in the car because we have nothing else to do. But rather we know where we're going, why we're going there, how we're going there, the appropriate way, what we need to bring with us. Okay. So think of, of how much easier our lives would be if we actually remembered to do the things that we re that we need to do instead of spacing out. Yeah, do you space out a lot? Yeah, do you ever walk in a room and go, I walked in here for some reason, what was it? You know, this seems to happen after 30 more and more, you know? Kind of it increases each year. Now, I was going here, there was some reason. Yeah, so if we really hone our introspective awareness, we'll remember where we're going and why we're going there. Once having prepared for an action, with the thought, my body will remain in such a way, then periodically I should look to see how the body is being maintained, okay? So if we've prepared for an action, we've decided to do something, we know what our body should be doing, then periodically we check in with our body and is our body moving the way we want it to move? Is it sitting the way we want it to sit, okay? This is a very interesting thing that happens when people come to stay at Shervasti Abbey because we're a monastic community. So there's different ways of doing things in a monastery than you do in your regular city life. And so we put on our website, we write all over the website, please wear loose-fitting clothes. Yeah, do not wear tight clothes. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all over the website. You know, please wear things that are one solid color and don't wear things that are low, low cut. Don't wear shorts. You know, you're coming to a monastery. Well, some people 
I don't know, maybe they don't read, or maybe <laughs> they forget, but they'll come to the Abbey in some tight-fitting shirt, you know, that's like down to here. <laughs> and, and they complete, you know, here they are sitting with a bunch of monastics, and they're, they're short shorts, and they're, they're low-cut shirt, and they don't even notice anything, you know? Doesn't even enter their mind. You know, how am I dressed and is it appropriate for this situation? And so we find it very interesting because we gently have to go up to some of these people and say, you know, this is a monastery and we try and keep our body more modest and more covered here. Uh, we have some really loose t-shirts. How would you like to wear them? <laughs> you know? <laughs> And, and so we have to help people sometimes uh, get the appropriate clothing for being at a monastery. Or again, you know, when you're at a monastery, uh, you know, with monastic, you don't stand with your hands on your hip and one leg stretched out, okay? And you don't sit with your, with your legs crossed, you know, and one leg kind of bobbing up and down like this. And when you're at the table, you don't sit there and drum your fingers, yeah? Because we're practicing mindfulness, yeah? But it, it's so interesting how people, when they come to the Abbey, really get introduced to the mindfulness practice in this very gross way because we'll say, are you aware of how you're sitting? Yeah? Is, is that really the way you want to sit in front of a monk or a nun? <laughs> you know? Or, um, uh, yeah, so just these kinds of things, because uh, so often we aren't mindful. We don't have introspective alertness. Or another thing, that's, that's really cute at the Abbey, because we eat in silence. And so, as monastics, you know, we train to, to eat in silence. We have metal bowls, so metal bowls make a lot of, a lot of noise. So we have wooden spoons, and we have to, you know, with our arm, alms bowl, which is made out of metal, we have to scoop the food gently and like this, otherwise it makes a lot of noise. So we'll have people come who aren't monastics. They don't eat out of our metal monastic bowls, but they'll eat out of, you know, regular ceramic bowls. And somebody will be eating cereal. <laughs> you know, and they're, they're, they're scooping up their cereal. And then, you know, it, it gets towards the end, and then they scrape their bowl, you know, and you hear... <laughs> and, you know, those of us who, are, who have been, we've been through this because we've all done that. We just sit there and like we're trying. Sometimes there was one guy who came. He was so cute, but so noisy. And we didn't say anything for many meals, you know, and hoping that he would like listen and, and realize how much noise he was making eating a cereal. Completely didn't even notice. It was a Like five days went by. <laughs> and then we kind of politely said, you know, it's part of our mindfulness practice to try and eat silently. Oh. <laughs> Okay, so, you know, there's all these small things in our life that we so often do very mindlessly. And what Shanti Deva is doing is saying, let's pay attention to what we do. Because sometimes in doing things mindlessly, our behavior is not very pleasing to other people or it's disturbing to other people. Whereas if we try and 
be aware of the situation and how to behave in it, then it just smooths the situation for all the other people who are there. Okay? So this is all part of the practice that we all go through when we come to a monastery. Yeah, even the people who are monastics, because we didn't start out that way. Okay. <laughs> okay. With the utmost effort, I should check to see that the crazed elephant of my mind is not wandering off, but is bound to the great pillar of thinking about the Dharma. So whatever situation I'm in, with that introspective awareness, make sure that this crazy elephant of my mind that likes to storm around the universe and make a mess, instead that I'm going to bind it with the rope of my mindfulness and I'm binding it to the Dharma so that I'm training my mind to have a Dharma thought no matter what I'm doing during my life not to let my mind just go into all sorts of random daydreams and thoughts because that way we waste a lot of time and then sometimes we wound up thinking in very negative ways if we just let, let our mind go, okay? So we want to take it and bind it to the Dharma and then we're happy now, we create ha happiness in the future. For those who strive by all means for concentration should not wander off for even a moment. By thinking, how is my mind behaving? They should closely analyze their mind. So if we're trying to develop concentration in our meditation, if we're meditating on shamatha or serenity, trying to develop concentration, then we need to really have a lot of mindfulness and introspective awareness. Otherwise, our mind really will wander off and it'll be impossible to concentrate. So when we're doing a serenity meditation, shamatha meditation, then mindfulness remembers the object of meditation, whether it's the visualized image of the Buddha or the breath or love or whatever our object of meditation is. It remembers that object and holds it in such a way that our mind doesn't get distracted. And then the introspective awareness comes up from time to time and checks, am I still meditating on the object that I put my mind on? Or am I falling asleep? Am I, you know, wandering the world, daydreaming, planning vacations? Uh, you know, what is really going on, yeah? And so that's how the mindfulness and the introspective awareness come together. Because introspective awareness, when it checks up, it sees we're still on our object of concentration, then we keep our mind there. But if it sees that we've gone off our object, then it helps us to bring it back. Okay, so that's why these two, mindfulness and introspective awareness, are very important, not only for ethical conduct, but also for, for ge generating concentration and wisdom. Okay. Now, the next verse says, but however, if I'm unable to do this, in other words, if I can't bind my mind to the object of meditation, I can't my mind, bind my mind to, um, uh, you know, the pillar of the Dharma, yeah, if I'm unable to do that, um, maybe I'm in a frightening situation, I'm afraid, or maybe there's a lot of celebration around me, yeah, then I should relax my mind, you know. And it says, likewise, it has been taught that at times of giving, one may be neutral to certain aspects of ethical conduct. So what this is meaning is if we're in a situation where we're very afraid and we have to act quickly, then we relax this, uh, the very strict mindfulness and introspective awareness and we do what we need to do quickly, okay? If you're crossing a street and a car is barreling towards you, that's not the time for slow, mindful walking, 
okay? It's the time to skedaddle and get out of the middle of the road, okay? Likewise, if you're in a situation with a lot of festivities and celebration, you can't just walk through it like some zombie, you know, like this. Uh, you have to relax your gaze, still try and be as mindful as you possibly can, because otherwise your mind will get you, get you into trouble. But you relax it a little bit, and you deal with what you need to deal with in the situation. Okay? So if you're sitting in the doctor's office and you know they're going to be calling your name, you don't sit in single-pointed samadhi meditation because the nurse is going to call your name and, you know, they're going to think that, I don't know what they're going to think. You know, you're sitting there like this in the doctor's office. No, you have to listen for your name so that you can get up and go and do what, do what you need to do. Okay? I should undertake whatever deed I have intended to do and think of doing nothing other than that. With my mind applied to that task, I should set about for the time being to accomplish it. Now, what, does, what is our modern day work ethic? Okay, here it says, I should undertake whatever deed I have intended to do and think of doing nothing other than it. What are our employers telling you to do now? Multitask. Yeah, don't just do one thing. They're completely saying the opposite of Shanti Deva. Don't just do one thing. You should be able to do five things all totally perfectly with complete concentration at the same time. That's what's being expected of people in the workforce. Is that realistic? It's nuts. Yeah. If we're trying to concentrate on more than one thing, do we do either of the things very well? I don't know about you, but I can't multitask very well. And if I'm, I can tell if, let's say, I'm on the phone and I'm trying to talk to somebody, I can tell if they're multitasking. Because it's clear they aren't paying attention to the conversation. How do you feel if you're talking to somebody and they're not paying attention to the conversation? How do you feel? You don't feel so good, okay? So similarly, if we're trying to multitask at the same time somebody's talking to us, they're not going to feel heard. They're not going to feel valued or listened to, okay? Or sometimes in the home, yeah? Here's the newspaper. So we multitask. Hi, kids. How was your day today? Oh, the sports section. This is pretty interesting. Oh, uh, yeah, so you got in a fight with somebody on the playground? Oh, um, did you hit him back? Mm -hmm. Oh, look, there's a really good ad. I should uh, go out and get this. Uh, Okay, so kids, go do your homework. Come on, get on, go do your homework. How often is, is that how you act as a parent? What's gonna happen to your kids? Are your kids gonna, do your kids feel like you care about them? Or do they feel like, they, like you care more about the newspaper? Or more about the computer? or more about exercising your thumbs, you know. Okay, hi kids, I'll send you a text message in a few minutes. Yeah, text me, tell me how your day was. I talk to people who tell, parents who tell me they find out more about their kids' days when their kids text them than when they talk to their kids. That's awful, isn't it? Here we are, human beings, 
who can look at each other's eyes and make contact and show each other we really care. And what do we do? We hide behind newspapers, we hide behind computer screens, we hide behind our iPhone thing. You know, I travel a lot. It is amazing. You get on a plane and people, I mean, they're still talking on their phones, writing on their iPods as they're walking down the aisles. They sit down, they're texting and talking madly. When the flight attendant says you have to turn the off button on, they all go into semi-paralysis and hysteria. It's like, I'm going, I'm having the DTs, you know, I'm going through withdrawal. How am I going to live without having my phone on, you know, with, together with all my other gadgets? And so they make it through takeoff, and then they take out their phones and they're working. And then, you know, they have to shut them down to land. And again, it's like, <gasps> And then as soon as we land, you know, then they pull them out again. And, you know, and people don't know how to relate to live human beings. We don't know how to look at each other in the eyes and smile at each other. And so we wonder why families are fractured and why children feel so lost because either you know they can't see their parent because there's a screen or a paper in front of their parents or their parents are acting like military police and drill sergeants okay time to do your homework sit down shut up do your homework why can't you do your homework properly all the other kids in this block do their homework how come I have to nag you every single day to sit down and do your homework all the other kids are getting hundreds on their class you are getting 98 you are doing terrible your life is never going to amount to anything sit down shut up and do your homework this is standard isn't it isn't it what does that do to a poor, sensitive child? You know? They, they feel that their parents' love is contingent on how they do their homework. They feel like they're letting mom and, down, mom and dad down just because they can't spell. I mean, it's horrible. What about being kind to children? and make, making learning fun and, you know, being a parent instead of a drill sergeant. Think about it. Yeah? Please, think about it. Because th these are the children. These are our future. Yeah? And they need parents, live parents, human beings, who look at them in the eye and with care and concern say, what did you do today? Tell me about your day. Tell me about your friends. Tell me about what you're interested in. Let's go do something fun together. How often do you do something fun with your kids? Yeah, the most fun you have is finally closing the homework book. Okay? So please think about this. <clears throat> you know, because what, what's valuable to you in your life? Isn't your family valuable? Isn't your spouse valuable? Aren't your kids valuable? So those are the people that we need to look at every day with love. Those are the people we need to really listen to. We have two ears and one mouth. We need to listen more than we speak and really care about them and what's happening with them. Hmm? 
okay, so with my mind applied to that task, I should set about for the time being to accomplish it. So we know what we're doing, we're doing one thing, and we're doing it well and focusing on it. By acting in this way, all will be done well. But by acting otherwise, neither action will be done well. And that's true when you're multitasking. Nothing really gets done very well. Likewise, there will be no increase in the uh, proximate disturbing conceptions that come from a lack of introspective awareness. So if we pay attention and we do what we need to be doing when we need to be doing it, then there's not going to be any increase in mental afflictions in our mind. But instead, our mind will remain steady and focused and we'll accomplish what we set out to do and we'll have a sense of well-being that we actually were able to do that. If I happen to be present while a senseless conversation is taking place, or if I happen to see some kind of spectacle show, I should abandon attachment towards it. Okay? So if we're in somewhere and there's a senseless conversation, you know, you're at the coffee machine at work and people are just sitting talking about the latest soap opera on TV, I don't know what programs you watch, but you know, people often talk about the characters in movies or in soap operas or whatever. So there's some senseless conversation going on. Or if you happen to see some kind of uh, entertainment show, then rather than get completely absorbed in the meaningless conversation or in the entertainment, yeah, we should abandon attachment towards it. So what this means is if we're walking by somewhere and there's a TV on, we don't have to stop and look at the TV. How many times at your home or maybe if you're in school, are you walking to go do something? You pass by a TV or somebody's playing a movie on their computer and then you, you see something on the screen and then you stop and you look at it. And then you sit and you hang out and you talk to the person for a while. Or you, then you actually sit down and you're watching the movie or you join in the senseless conversation. Yeah. So that kind of thing can happen very, very easily. And then a lot of time goes by. Or you're walking by and there's some new advertisement. You know, you know how, because they're always trying to make the advertisements really flashy and exciting. And so you're walking somewhere and there's this big flash and a sound and, and you stop and look. And, and then, meanwhile, the media is controlling you, telling you what to buy, what you need to have to be happy. Okay? So what Shanti Deva is saying, you know, when we're walking past a place with senseless conversation, or where there's a commercial, some kind of entertainment, let's not get distracted. Let's do what we set out to do and keep our mind focused on only that. Okay? If for no reason I start digging the earth, picking at the grass, or drawing patterns on the ground, then by recalling the advice of the Buddhas, I should immediately stop out of fear, out of a sense of danger. Okay, so this is in a society where people usually are sitting the ground, and it's very easy to, you sit and you dawdle in the ground or you dig the earth, or you pick at the grass, okay? So if we were to modernize it, you know, when I'm sitting at my desk and I start, start drawing cartoons and designs, okay, do you do that? Or uh, uh, I start uh, playing with my hair and wrapping my hair around my finger, or I start, you know, with some nervous habit, doing this, or this, or, you know, I start doing some kind of distracting things, drumming my fingers, or cracking my nails, 
or, you know, something like that. So what it's talking about is when I'm doing something mindlessly without any awareness, then by recalling the advice of the Buddha, I should immediately stop. Why? Because it's a dangerous situation. Why is it dangerous? Because I have this precious human life and I'm wasting my energy doing frivolous things. And I'm, wait, and I'm doing something that could very easily draw me into doing another kind of activity that would be negative karma. Okay? So to, to really be quite aware. Yeah. It's the same kind of thing when you go into the store to get something. Can you walk into the store, get what you need, and walk out? How many people can go in, get what they need, and walk out without buying any extra items? How many of you can do that? Mm, few. Okay. But m many people get into the store, oh, I need this, but oh, there's that. Huh. That might be nice to have as well. Hmm. Yeah, let's get this. And then we wind up going in for one item, coming out with five or six. And then we wonder where our salary goes and why our credit card bill is so high. Yeah, This is a big problem in my country. So many people are in credit card debt, you know, because they just go in the store and give, the, give their credit card without any introspective awareness of how much they're putting on their credit card. And then at the end of the month, they get the credit card bill and they're like, uh, 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 you know, and they don't have enough money to pay. And, and then the interest rate is what, like 14, 15%? Goodbye money, you know? This is exactly how they hook you. And it's due to our lack of introspective awareness. You know, not paying attention and buying things that we don't really need. Whenever I have the desire to move my body or to say something, first of all, I should examine my mind and then with steadfastness act in the proper way. Okay, so when I have, whenever I have the desire to move my body or to say something, First of all, I look at my motivation. I look at my intention. Do I have a good intention? Am I acting with kindness? Am I acting with non-harmfulness? Okay, and if we see we are, then continue doing the action. If we see we aren't, then stop and change our motivation. Whenever there is attachment in my mind and whenever there is the desire to be angry, I should not do anything or say anything, but remain like a piece of wood. So here's more piece of wood examples. There's attachment in my mind. I really want to buy this. Or there's the desire to be angry. That person didn't do their share on the pro project. I want to get even. Okay? So at that time, when we notice those kind of thoughts, we shouldn't do or say anything, but remain like a piece of wood. A piece of wood does not care about that stuff. A piece of wood does not have attachment. A piece of wood does not have the wish to hurt somebody else's feelings. Okay, so we, we stop, we pause. Okay. So are you getting this, what this is talking about? Yeah? piece of wood doesn't care. Whenever I have distracted thoughts, the wish to verbally belittle others, feelings of self-importance or self-satisfaction, when I have the intention to descri describe the faults of others, pretension and the thought to deceive others, whenever I am eager for praise or have the desire to blame, blame others for self-satisfaction, Ah, I am so wonderful. 
I do things in the best way. This company should be so happy to have me here. I did such a good job, and I want everybody to know it. Whenever we have that kind of mental attitude, stop, pause, make our mind like a piece of wood. A piece of wood doesn't go bragging. A piece of wood doesn't go, oh, look at my They're prettier than yours. Yeah, a piece of wood doesn't care. When we have the intention to describe the faults of others, so we're talking to our friend and we really want to, you know, tell them, oh, look at what so-and-so did. They did this, they did this. They think they're such hot stuff, but blah, 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 blah. Stop. Become like a piece of wood. Whenever we have pretension, so we pretend to have qualities that we don't have, or we have deceit and we hide our faults. Instead of acting like that, become like a piece of wood. Piece of wood doesn't have to, you know, pretend it's something it's not. Piece of wood doesn't have to cover up what it is. Okay. Uh, whenever I am eager for praise, when I'm dropping hints to somebody so that they'll praise me, you know that one? Yeah, do you do that sometimes? Yeah, or I have the desire to blame somebody, so I did something wrong, but I don't want to own it, so it's somebody else's fault. Yeah, so we have those desires. Whenever I have the wish to speak harshly and cause disputes, so instead of speaking kindly in ways that bring people together and create harmony, I really want to get people mad at each other. If I get them mad at each other, then I'm going to benefit. If I talk about my colleague badly to my boss, then my, co then my boss won't like my colleague, then they'll think better of me and give me the promotion. That's a dumb boss who does that, you know. Okay, so in all these kinds of times, we should remain like a piece of wood. Piece of wood doesn't do that, doesn't care about that kind of stuff. Whenever I desire mental gain, honor, or fame, whenever I seek attendance or a circle of friends, and when in my mind I wish to be served, at all those times I should remain like a piece of wood. So whenever I'm craving for material gain, I want more money, I want more possessions, I want honor, I want recognition, I want fame, yeah, and all those kinds of situations, be like a piece of wood. A piece of wood doesn't need to be famous. Doesn't need to Yeah, let go of that stuff. Whenever I seek attendance or a circle of friends, in other words, I want to be the star of the show, the most important one, so when I walk in the room, everybody notices me because there's a bunch of people following following me, you know, okay. So whenever we have that kind of impulse, be like a piece of wood. When in my mind I wish to be served, I come home from work and expect my husband and wife to be, or husband or wife to be my slave. Yeah. I work so hard at work, you serve me. That's sometimes our attitude, isn't it? come home from work, you know. We treat the person that we love, not as somebody we love, but as a servant. Where's my dinner? Did you do this? Did you get all the errands done? How come the floor is still a mess? Okay, when we have the desire to be like that, pause. Yeah, we are not the center of the universe. Our family members are not our servants. In fact, we're practicing bodhicitta. We are the servants of others. Whenever I have the wish to decrease or stop working for others and the desire to pursue my welfare alone, 
If motivated by such thoughts, a wish to say something occurs. At these times, I should remain like a piece of wood. Okay, so when we lose our energy to work for the benefit of others, when our bodhicitta is declining, when we want to just pursue our own spiritual path for our own benefit, okay, then we make our mind like a piece of wood. We don't follow those thoughts. We don't get involved with them. Whenever I have impatience, laziness, cowardice, shamelessness, or the desire to talk nonsense, if thoughts of partiality arise, at these times too, I should remain like a piece of wood. Okay? So we're impatient. Come on, we gotta go somewhere. Get off your mm and move. Okay? Or when we're the lazy one, oh, leave me alone, I'll do that later. Or when we're cowardly, instead of working for the benefit of others, we're like so afraid something bad's gonna happen to us. When, when, whenever we lose our sense of ethical and moral integrity, whenever we have the desire to just talk a bunch of rubbish, yeah, Whenever our mind is partial, we like this person, we don't like that person, then at all those times, be like a piece of wood. A piece of wood doesn't care about that stuff. Having in this way examined their minds for disturbing conceptions and for thoughts that strive for meaningless things, the courageous bodhisattvas should hold their minds steady through the application of remedial forces. Okay, so the bodhisattvas, you know, stop themselves from doing these negative actions and they make their minds very steady. They keep their love and compassion very steady. And if a, an affliction arises, anger, jealousy, arrogance, something like that, if that arises in their mind, then they apply the, the opponent force, the remedial thought. So if, if greed arises in the mind, they contemplate impermanence. If anger arises in the mind, they contemplate patience or love. If jealousy arises in the mind, they contemplate rejoicing. If arrogance arises in the mind, they think that every, everything they know comes from others. So there are always these great bodhisattvas don't invite negative thoughts in their minds, and if negative thoughts come in, they immediately change the way they're looking at the situation and let go of that negative thought and replace it by a positive one. So that's what actual Dharma practice is all about, doing that. Okay, so let's stop here. So we finished verse 54. I'm, I haven't made up my mind yet, but I'm kind of thinking tomorrow is a public talk. You know, we're talking about precious human life, so it's a good time to bring your friends and relatives and people who are new. But I'm also thinking that some of the verses in this chapter are very helpful for new people, so I might bring some of them in tomorrow night as well. We'll see. Okay. So now we can do some questions. Actually, I'll start on this pile. You're welcome to write some more. Okay, so um, the question came up when, uh, when somebody experiences pain or some kind of tragedy, do we just go and say to them, oh, well, that's your negative karma? Yeah. And isn't that, doesn't that sound a bit hard-hearted? And especially if somebody's not Buddhist, isn't that a bit rude? Yes, definitely, yeah. For somebody who's not a Buddhist, you don't talk about karma, yeah. That, that, and especially when 
they have some suffering, that's not the time to introduce them to the idea of karma. When we experience some adversity and we say, you know, that's due to karma, that is not saying that somebody deserves to suffer. Okay, when we get sick, yeah, is our sickness related to our karma? Isn't, you know, if we're suffering from sickness, isn't it because we did some kind of negative action in the past, in a previous life, or earlier this life? You know, our own actions have, have to do with what we experience, okay? But the fact that negative karma is involved with our present sickness, does that mean we deserve to be sick? No. Okay. Does that mean that if somebody gives us medicine, they're interfering with our karma? No, doesn't mean that. Okay? So all we're doing, you know, when we say that something is, you know, negative karma is involved, is saying that yes, our mind has something to do with what we experience. Okay? When we have positive experiences, we have no problem at all thinking that's due to my good karma, do we? Yeah, we have some positive experience. Somebody says, oh, you must have a lot of merit. We have no problem with somebody saying that, okay? But when, we, when we're sick and we think that's due to my own negative actions, or if, you know, somebody else says that, then we get so defensive. Oh, are you blaming me for being sick? Are you saying I deserve to be sick? Of course not. Okay? When you see somebody sick, yeah, of course we reach out with com compassion and help them. Yeah? If somebody gets hit on the, by a car and they're lying in the middle of the street bleeding, do you walk by and say, Oh, what a pity. This is due to your negative karma. If I take you to the hospital, I'm interfering with your karma. I mean, come on, let's use our common sense. Of course nobody says that. You know, compassion is really what's called for all the time as much as possible. Okay? But like I said, you, you introduce this idea of karma in, in a very general way to people who are interested in Buddhism who want to understand about karma. You don't go up to somebody who's not Buddhist and say, oh, well, that's too bad you're getting divorced. That's due to your karma. I mean, that's horrible. You don't say that. Not very sensitive. Okay? Um, so how do we speak to non-Buddhists about tragedies? With compassion, wow, you're suffering. What can I do to help you? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of suffering in this world. I'm sorry that happened to you. How can I help? That's what you say to non-Buddhists when there's tragedy. Okay. Um, and then somebody said, what happens if we uh, create a lot of merit, but we don't instantly see any good results? When you plant a seed in the ground, do you dig it up the next day to see if it sprouted? If you keep digging it up every day to see if it's sprouting, is it ever going to sprout or are you just going to wreck it? Okay. We create merit because it's good to create the causes of happiness. Yeah, we want to create the causes of happiness. Our contentment, our satisfaction is in creating the causes of happiness. We're not going around all day saying, you know, I offered an apple to the Buddha yesterday. I should have some good result today. You know, otherwise, I mean, why am I offering apples to the Buddha? I'm wasting these apples. I should get some instant good result. Otherwise, phony baloney, I'm not offering anything to the Buddha again. 
Are you going to get anywhere practicing Dharma with that kind of attitude? Sounds like you're doing business with the Buddha. I gave you an apple, Buddha. Where's my reward? Next time, first you give me good result. First I'll pray for the good result. Buddha, you give me the good result, then I'll give you an apple. Yeah. It's not pay before, it's not pay first and get later. You know, that we have a business mind towards making offerings. Of course, we're not going to get anywhere in our spiritual practice with that kind of attitude. We have to create virtue and be generous and be kind because we like to be kind, because we want to help others, because it feels so good inside to create merit. It feels good to create the cause of happiness. So that's why we do it. Then we have good results now, good results in the future. And what kind of karma is it that my questions from today multiply when I haven't finished the ones from two days ago yet? <laughs> do you feel sorry for me? <laughs> Desires are bad. Who said that? Did the Buddha say that? The Buddha say desires is bad? I don't remember the Buddha saying that. How about the desire to attain enlightenment or the desire to develop mindfulness in meditation? We have to understand the, the teachings correctly. The word desire in English has many different meanings. One word for desire can mean sexual desire. Another word for desire, another meaning of desire can be desire for material possessions. But we can also desire to have an education. We can desire to be a kind person. We can desire to attain enlightenment. We can desire to develop mindfulness. Who said desire is bad? Okay. Even the desires for material benefit, did the Buddha say that's bad? You look in the scriptures and see if the Buddha said, you are bad if you, ha if you desire possessions. You find some place where the Buddha said that. Okay. The Buddha, we, we put things into the good and bad framework very easily, but they don't belong in a framework of good and bad. They belong in a framework of what brings benefit and what brings harm. What is realistic? What is unrealistic? Okay? A greedy mind having greed, is greed beneficial? Greed's not beneficial. Are you a bad person if you're greedy? No, you are not a bad person if you're greedy. The greed is not beneficial. But we can't say the person who has greed is a bad person. That person has the Buddha nature. How can they be a bad person? So look at your mind that likes to say things are good or bad. And I'm really emphasizing this here because all all the time I encounter questions like this. Somebody will come and say, the Buddha said we're not supposed to get angry. I said, really? You go find a statement in the sutras where the Buddha says you're not supposed to get angry. Buddha never said, thou shalt not get angry. Yeah. Buddha said, when you're angry, Check and see if anger helps you or if anger harms you. Look at your anger and see if it's understanding the situation 
correctly or if it's understanding the situation in a skewed and exaggerated way. That's what the Buddha's talking about. The Buddha never said you're not supposed to get angry. Okay? Do you see how our way of thinking is very black and white, good, bad, supposed to, not supposed to? But that isn't understanding what the Dharma is all about. The Dharma is about what is beneficial, what is helpful, and what is harmful and creates problems. What is reality? What is realistic? What is exaggeration? Okay, that's how we have to look at things. If I'm helping somebody out of goodwill, but they're taking me for granted, should I continue to help this person if they need help desperately? You have to, um, you know, these kind of questions are really hard for me to answer because the person who's asking them is thinking about a very specific incident, but of course they have to ask a general question. They can't tell me the whole incident on a piece of paper. But I can't give personal advice that applies to one incident, you know, or one circumstance by answering a general question because I don't know that the person who wrote this is thinking about one situation, but I may not be thinking about that situation. So I can't give accurate advice. You know, it would be really unfair for me. To, to give advice in this kind of situation. So please excuse me if I don't. Yeah, because whenever you give advice, you have to know what the situation is. Yeah. Let's see if today's questions are easier. <sighs> please advise, how do we radiate loving kindness to another person? Ah. How do we radiate loving kindness to another person? We open our heart and we see that everybody's exactly like us. Everybody wants to be happy exactly like we want to be happy. Nobody wants to suffer exactly like we don't want to suffer. When we really look at all these other people around us, different things may make us happy Different things may cause us suffering, but we're all exactly the same in wanting happiness and not suffering. And if we really can sit with that and look at everybody in the eye and realize this person just wants happiness, they don't want suffering, then it becomes so much easier to have an affectionate attitude towards them. Yeah because they're just like us. And we can see that whatever they're doing, they're doing simply because they're trying to be happy. Not because they're mean, not because they're awful, but they're just trying to be happy. They're just like me. Wouldn't it be wonderful if they had happiness and the causes of happiness? Okay. Wouldn't it be nice if all the people who were lonely had hearts that were full of love and extended their love to others? Wouldn't it be nice if all the people who were stingy had the wish to be generous and loved seeing the smile on somebody else's face when they practiced generosity? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Okay. Wouldn't it be wonderful if somebody who was sad found something that interested them in life and could look outside of themselves and work for the benefit of others and pull themselves out of their own sadness? Wouldn't that be nice? Okay. Wouldn't it be nice if the people who lack self-confidence could realize that they have so much inner beauty in their hearts and they, they have so many 
unique talents in their hearts. Couldn't, wouldn't it be wonderful if they could see that and extend those talents and extend those individual beautiful characteristics to others? Okay, so we just think along that line, you know? And we think of the different sufferings that people have and we think, wouldn't it be wonderful if they had the mental state that they needed to go beyond that suffering? Or if they had whatever physical thing they needed to, you know, ease their, ease their pain. Yeah. So this is a good way to we don't know what to think about. Okay? When you're bored, do the metta meditation. Think kind thoughts like this towards others. Excellent way to get rid of boredom. Hmm? How do we truly repent to the Buddha? Um, again, I'm going to talk about repentance and confession uh, in more depth over the weekend uh, at the retreat. So please come on Saturday and Sunday for the retreat. And because there I will be talking a lot about repentance and confession, purification, how to ease our heart uh, and clear away guilt. And I'll also be talking about how to rejoice at our own and others' virtue, how to make offerings, how to develop humility and so forth. So um, please come for the weekend. And also, many of you who are wanting to have a daily practice, you say, oh, I listen to many teachings, but I don't know what to practice. If you come to the retreat on the weekend, we'll be going through the seven limb practice. And that is a very, very beautiful daily practice to do. So if you're looking for, you know, how to start a, a simple daily practice, the weekend retreat will be very good for you as well. How do I remain like a piece of wood if I re receive unfair treatment again and again? <laughs> well, if you don't remain like a piece of wood, what are your alternatives? Okay? Again and again, these people are unfair to me. Always, I'm the one. Ever since I was a little kid, my brother got more than I did. My sister got more than I did. I was the one who was always blamed when the children were naughty. Whenever I went to school, you know, and we fought on the playground, I got blamed. The other kids always went home. Now in school, you know, I do work, really work hard in my classes. I study very hard, but then I, the teachers are so unfair and prejudiced against me. And then I go out to work, and my clients and my colleagues, my boss, everybody doesn't treat me fairly. They treat p other people better. They are very full of partiality. I never get fair treatment in my whole life ever since I was a kid. Well, you could remain like a piece of wood or you could talk like that. What do you want to do? Yeah? When we sit there and we bellyache about how other people always mistreat us and we always get the raw end of the deal and we bellyache and we bellyache and we bellyache, what are the results? Yeah? What are the results? Does it get us anywhere? Or maybe you want me to say, we receive unfair treatment. So I'm going to go in, I'm going to complain to my parents and tell them they always mistreated me. And then I'm going back to primary school and I'm going to tell them off because they always mistreated me. And then I'm going to my college and, and I'm telling them that they mistreated me and my boss is, mistreats me now and my husband wife mistreats me. I'm tired of people mistreating me again and again and being unfair. I'm going to tell them all off. 
Yeah, you want to be that kind of person? Yeah, is that how you want to act towards other people? Or maybe, you know, we want to go suck our thumb. Everybody just doesn't treat me fair. Poor me, poor me. Yeah, I'm very good at having pity parties for myself. Yeah, yeah. everybody gets more than I do. Everybody gets better. Poor me, the whole world is fair. <laughs> you know, look at our mind. Can we laugh at ourselves? Can you laugh at your mind? Yeah? Can you laugh at the mind that is saying, you know, the world mistreats me? Yeah? Maybe the person who wrote this question is really ticked off at me now. <laughs> I'm going to see tomatoes coming up. <laughs> no, I think we have to, you know, learn to laugh at ourselves a little bit and how much our mind exaggerates situations and makes a big deal about things. And sometimes it's just so much easier to chill out. Yeah. Who ever said that everybody was going to treat me fairly? Where's that rule of the universe that I'm going to get treated fairly? Or let me ask the question this way. Who in this room feels that they are always treated fairly in every circumstance? Please raise your hand if you feel like you have never been treated unfairly. Anybody in this room? Okay. So let's just kind of relax a little bit about some of this. And laugh at ourselves, not take ourselves so seriously, you know, not think we're the only one on the planet that is miserable, yeah. But instead, look at other sentient beings. Look at them with the eye of affection. Think of all the people in this world who are not being treated fairly right now. And they're suffering a lot worse than we are. Maybe they live in a country where there's famine and people have sent food, but there's corruption and so the food isn't reaching them. That's being treated unfairly, but it's resulting in those people starving. Do we have it that bad because people treat us unfairly? No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So maybe we're talking about international situations where silence is consent. Okay. In that kind of situation, if, si if you're in a situation where silence is being viewed as consent, but you don't consent, then you should say something. If you don't say anything, but then accuse everybody else of not listening to you, what can they do? <laughs> yeah? So. When, there, when there's, it's the time to speak up, we should speak up. You can speak politely. You can make your voice known. Yeah. But when there's the time, then we do it. Okay. One more question. How do we deal with a difficult boss, one that's demanding, unpredictable temperament? 
did you all write this question? <laughs> I get so many questions. Are there any good bosses in Singapore? <laughs> and how about if you're a boss and somebody asks this kind of question, and what do you feel? How do you deal with a different boss? Difficult boss? Try being a nice employee. Yeah? Try being nice to your boss. Could be that your boss feels nobody listens to them. Yeah? Did you ever think of what it's like to be your boss and have to deal with people like you? Yeah? I did that. I mean, think, think of it. I, I used to sit and think, what must it have been like to be my parents and have a kid like me? Mama mia. You know? Because we always look at things through our viewpoint. I want, I want, I deserve. But what's it like for the other person who has to deal with us? Are we easy to get along with? Are we kind? Do we exaggerate things? Are we demanding? You know? So think about it a little bit. What's it like for your boss to have an employee like you? What's it like for your husband or wife to have a spouse like you? Hmm? So instead of always looking at how we can change other people because they're doing so many things wrong, Let's look at how we can change ourselves so that we can be people who are easier to communicate with, so we can be better listeners, so we can be more sensitive and kind. You know? So bring something nice into, to eat into your workplace and leave it out for your colleagues. Smile at your boss once in a while. Yeah. How do you think your boss feels whenever they walk down the hall and everybody goes like that? <laughs> yeah. Maybe your boss feels like the Olympic coach. As soon as they enter the room, boom, everybody runs. You know? <laughs> yeah. Try it. Okay. So we have to draw to a close this evening. I'll add these to my pile. <laughs> and then we'll start with them. Anybody feel sorry for me when I answer some questions? Why do people always ask me so many questions? More questions than I can ever answer. Oh. <laughs> Due to this merit, may we soon attain the enlightened state of Guru Buddha, that we may be able to liberate all sentient beings from their suffering. May the precious Bodhi mind not yet born arise and grow. May the born have no decline, but increase forevermore.